Welcome to Worship with Ascension Lutheran Church in Nelson, BC. Today is February 19th and the Transfiguration of Our Lord Sunday. In our lessons today, we hear how on a high mountain Jesus is revealed as God's beloved Son, echoing the words at his baptism. This vision of glory sustains us as Jesus faces his impending death in Jerusalem. This week begins the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday and our yearly baptismal journey through Lent and the Holy Week to Easter. If you are able, join us at Nelson United for a shared service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Our service today will have hymns, lessons, prayers, special music, and a sermon. Some of us will worship through this video. Some of us will gather at our church building for worship. No matter where we are, we are together in spirit, and we're really glad you're here. You are welcome in the name of God, the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. The Almighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. God, our God, shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. With a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm, God calls the heavens and the earth from above. God, our God, shines forth in glory. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the goodness of man, and all creation shouts in joy. God, our God, shines forth in glory. Almighty God, the resilient light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son, and illumine the world with your image, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading. We highlight life-altering moments with fanfare, fireworks, and balloons. We herald big events with cries, symbols, and special language. When God is revealed, we are awestruck as portrayed in Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders, he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled in on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses out of the cloud. 
Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Second reading. Jesus' transfiguration was life-changing for his disciples, elevating him from mortality to revelation of God. Holy Scripture speaks to us of that surprise in epic language naming how God's Spirit is unveiled, recorded in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses to his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but by men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen.
Our gospel is from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our sermon today for Transfiguration Sunday has been graciously provided to us. To bring some context to today's sermon, I would like to begin by reading a short introduction written by the author. Grace and peace to you from God, our Holy Parent. My name is Janelle Lightborn. I am a seminary student at Martin Luther University College. I am also a candidate for ordination in the Eastern Synod and am currently serving as an intern at St. Philip's Lutheran Church in Etobicoke, Ontario. I am originally from the Bahamas and moved to Canada in 2005 for university. I am also a black woman. Since I was 10 years old, I have been aware and have had experiences of racism. This has made me acutely aware of how racism and white supremacy affect black, indigenous, and people of color, communities, and structures of our society and our church. I also do my best to lean into the hope that we carry collectively. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this week and especially during Black History Month, a time when we celebrate the contributions people of African descent have made to Canadian culture and invigorate our ongoing work of racial justice. With peace and love, Janelle. The conversation within the black community around what kinds of images and adjectives are used to portray and describe people of the African diaspora is ever evolving. It has been interesting to see it develop. Perhaps this conversation evolves so readily because of the heavy stereotypes that exist, shaping a narrative of black people as comical, lazy, loud, and thuggish. These images are hard to witness, especially when folks who identify as black are aware of their own diversities and complexities. There is a pressing need to use self-reflection descriptors and write authentic narratives. This need is balanced with the struggle of knowing how to portray black culture and identity in a way that is best, that best captures a full range of emotions and experiences. 
In part, the work of reshaping this narrative has come in response to the overwhelming amounts of negative images of black people in the media, especially images of black men who are victims of police brutality. And so, to counter the negativity and fill out the narrative, images of victims in a graduation cap and gown or pictures of them smiling and laughing while holding their children are widely shared and promoted. Recall the picture of George Floyd, who was murdered by police in 2020, holding up a Bible with his Bible study group, shared in answer to the videos and photos of him on the ground struggling to breathe. This year, there has been an influx of pictures of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife and co-laborer Coretta Scott King, not on the front lines of marches with stoic expressions, but on the beach lounging by the pool, laughing together and relaxing. A statue in honor of the Kings has been unveiled in Boston in January. The creator Hank Willis Thomas drew inspiration from the statue, for the statue from a photograph that was taken of the couple after Reverend King won the Nobel Prize in 1964. In the photo, both Reverend King's arms are wrapped around Mrs. King in a tight hug. She has her eyes closed and both are smiling widely looking proud and joyful, almost playful. Aptly, the statue is called The Embrace. This seems that this statue, The Embrace, and the photograph that inspired it are a part of the evolving conversation. There are more and more voices inviting others to see all the different parts of, black, of a black person's experience the joy and the hardships and the re and the regardless and regardless of the image to see that person as a beloved human being deserving of respect and dignity the art piece has received mixed reviews from the artist made his point clear in his own words the statue is about the capacity for each of us to be enveloped in love. At the Transfiguration, God gives the disciples and the Mathean Church a fuller vision of who Jesus is. We don't have any definite answers on the purpose of this event or this text, but there are many explanations that help us make sense of this story. A lot of these explanations focus on the disciples Peter, James, and John, and the original hearers of the text. Matthew's community was experiencing much suffering and conflict with the Roman Empire, and amongst themselves, and needed a reminder of the resurrected Christ who they were following. In our text, we read that Jesus climbs up a high mountain with Peter, James, and John. And there on this mountain, by themselves, Jesus is transfigured before them. His face and clothes shine. He is awe-inspired and brilliant. Jesus radiates light, and Jesus is light. Is It is posited that for the disciples and this century community, this image of Jesus in his radiant glory was to be an image that stayed with them as they endured their hardships. The words, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him, him 
affirmed their belief in Jesus as the Messiah and recommitted them to a life of obedience to Jesus. The transfiguration was a source of hope and strength to keep following and walking in the way of Jesus in spite of the trouble. Reading this text in light of Black History Month, however, invites us to wonder what purpose the transfiguration served for Jesus. Before the transfiguration, Jesus had been going about his ministry as usual, preaching and healing, being tested by the religious leaders and misunderstood by his own disciples. Matthew 16 verse 21 tells us that Jesus began to show his disciples another part of his experience and, sh and, a share, and share a bit more of what his road ahead was going to look like. He was going to Jerusalem. He would suffer at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes. He would be killed and raised back to life. Even though Peter gets his confession right that Jesus is the Messiah, he still doesn't fully understand what his confession means for Jesus. Jesus' experience, what he knew about himself and his journey, goes unheard and is denied. Perhaps Jesus himself needed a space where all the different parts of his identity and his experience could be fully seen and acknowledged. A space where he was reminded that he was beloved. The transfiguration offered him that. Up until this point, the disciples and his community had known him as a teacher, a healer, and even a prophet like Elijah or Jeremiah. To be sure, each of these is a role that Jesus fills, but none alone captures his full identity. On the mountaintop, every part of Jesus' identity was on display in front of God his holy parent who knew him through and through and on display in front of his most trusted disciples. Perhaps the words of affirmation spoken by God, this is my son, the beloved in whom I am well pleased, were Jesus's own much needed source of strength and hope. And after a short moment of glory and radiance, the world went back to what it was. No prophets of old, no audible divine voice, no light emanating from Jesus' face. The world has gone back to what it was, but the disciples cannot return to their same old image of Jesus. They had been changed into a community that would be able to hold onto Jesus' radiance and his glory, even while they walked the long road to Jerusalem. As they descended, they carried the seeds of a community that would be able to see that this radiance was also a part of who Jesus was. And even as the glory faded, see that Jesus was still glorious and beloved regardless of his suffering, his circumstances, or what he looked like. Glorious on the mountain and in the valley, glorious as he begged for a different path on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane, glorious as he suffered on the cross, glorious as he laid in the tomb, glorious in the garden as the risen Christ. Let's imagine how Jesus felt even for a short while that he was on that mountain. Did he have a sense of safety and wholeness, vulnerability? Was he relieved, understood? We cannot say what Jesus' exact experience was, but we know that these kinds of safe spaces are what we are all, 
what we all long for and deserve. We all want to be in a relationship and communities where no part of us needs to be hidden, where we can be fully known and still counted as glorious and beloved. For many Indigenous people, Black folks, and people of color, these kinds of spaces are few and far between. This is especially true in Canada, where Indigenous and Black communities experience marked disadvantages in employment, housing, and home ownership, and education, where they are grossly overrepresented in prisons and the criminal justice system. The response to this kind of environment is so split and hid away parts of the self, not because of a lack of confidence, fortitude, or self-understanding. This hiding, or more aptly, safekeeping of one's personhood is done in order to survive in a society that creates these very real inequities. Perhaps you have heard of code switching, where members of a marginalized where mar members of marginalized groups often unconsciously change the way they talk, dress, and act in order to make others feel comfortable. This is done in exchange for fair treatment, quality service, and employment opportunities. Scholar and civil rights activist W.E.B. Dubois describes code switching as a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. One ever feels their two-ness, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals on one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. This is exhausting, and it invites us to ask, where are the spaces where, where Black, Indigenous, and people of color can feel some relief from this hiding. And even in the ideal of being fully understood, it is not realized where one, where can black indigenous people of color simply be safe and whole? Are our churches that safer space and community? Can they be? My siblings, God is continuously creating safe spaces for those who need them most. These are spaces where person's voice is valued, where folks apologize and are held accountable when wrongs inevitably occur, where we are all allowed to be ordinary and messy and still be treated as beloved. I hope you hear in these words today a deep need and an invitation to be a safer space. May we be or become communities where folks who are on the margins can turn their code switchers off for just a little while. May we hear the call of the transfiguration to look and listen and to acknowledge light where we did not see it before. May we truly see each other and name each other glorious and beloved as we continue to walk with God on the long road of wholeness and liberation. Amen. Please join me in saying the statement of faith into which we are all baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Using the words, merciful God, we respond, receive our prayer. Embolden your church as it witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Equip lay preachers, deacons, and pastors. Move us to share our stories of your faithfulness and forgiveness. May our lives proclaim your greatness. Bless our BC Bishop Kathy and our interim pastor Brenda. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Dwell with your whole creation from the tallest mountain peak to the deepest valley. Bless the work of conservation organizations and protect vital habitats of wildlife and old growth forests. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world. We particularly remember the people of Turkey and Syria suffering through the aftermath of devastating earthquakes. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Give shelter to those lacking safe homes. Spur communities to work for fair housing for all. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound, sick, or isolated, especially Marianne, Anne, Kim, Terry, Judy, and those we name in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be with us as we live our mission as a community of Christians empowered by the grace of God through word and sacrament to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Please join with me in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod Bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. Yeah.